Thank you very much. So at this conference, we've heard about the need for skilled trade. We've heard about the importance of STEM and the suggestion that businesses can do well by doing good, not a new idea. I'm here to discuss something that touches on each of these topics, entrepreneurship. Now, I'm supposed to discuss the role of entrepreneurship in building a new economy and the role of business, the role that business plays in talent development. It seems to me there's no greater intersection of the new economy, entrepreneurship, and talent development than the millennials. Recently, a friend of mine, Denise Morrison, the CEO of Campbell Soup, spoke to the Executives Club of Chicago. And during her remarks, she centered on something that we've been talking about at Ariel, the tremendous entrepreneurial spirit of millennials. They aren't just breaking into companies, they're starting their own. We're seeing that every single day. It's obviously wildly exciting and has enormous implications for businesses, big and small alike. America's story has been the story of the entrepreneur. I mean, those are the people who pioneered the path across the country, the new frontier to realize a dream. Michigan's history, of course, we all know, is intertwined with that of entrepreneurs. Several of the companies represented in this room are, were founded by a spark of innovation or wisdom or vision from a very young person. In many ways, that's also the story of my firm, Ariel. When our chairman and chief investment officer, John Rogers, started our company back in 1983, he was 24 years old. He had cobbled together $200,000 from family and friends to start an investment firm because he had this passion for investing in small and medium-sized companies. He was a quintessential entrepreneur when you think of America because John only had two and a half years of business experience. He'd gone to Princeton where he played basketball and then worked, went to work for a brokerage firm called William Blair and Company. But it was there that he realized that maybe he could do this on his own. His entrepreneurial passion was born. Today, we're jaded by stories of young entrepreneurship, you know, especially in tech. We hear about all of these, they call them baby CEOs that are running these giant companies. But back then, there really weren't stories of 24-year-olds starting investment firms, especially black 24-year-olds. But John's passion came naturally. His father had given him stocks every birthday and every Christmas, starting when he was 12 years old, instead of toys. He said, it wasn't very fun in the beginning. He'd run to the Christmas tree, and the only thing he'd have was a white envelope. And he said the worst part, it, you know, th this was an affront in and of itself, but the worst part is on Christmas Day, or on your birthday, your friends ask you, what did you get? And they would say they got Monopoly or GI Joe, and John would say, I got IBM shares. <laughs> but here's the thing that was, made it work. His father always allowed him to keep the dividend checks. This was a modest portfolio, so don't get me wrong. His father had been a child of the Depression, moved to Chicago as an orphan when he was 11 years old and was in the first class of the Tuskegee Airmen. He wanted to make sure his son understood money. So he allowed him to keep these very modest dividend checks, and he said it didn't matter if it was 50 cents or $50, he was getting this free money in the mail. And John said because of that, he was a 12-year-old with cash flow. And if he wanted to buy a candy bar, he could. Hence, you know, him falling in love with the stock market. So you jump forward 32 years from when he was 24 year old, years old to today. We've grown from two people when Ariel was started to 91 people. And we manage just under $11 billion in assets for some of you sitting out in the room. We have some of your pension money. And somewhat might say that we're established, but I have to tell you, we feel like entrepreneurs every single day, and we're certainly trying to get the youngest people in our firm to carry that entrepreneurial spirit with them and keep it alive, just like it was when John first started the firm. So who are these enterprising millennials you hear about all the time? Well, in the US, there are 75 million of them. 75 million people born in a 20-year cohort between 1980 and the mid-2000s, 75 million. They're the generation that grew up, as we all know, with cell phones, access to the internet basically their whole lives, especially during their formative years. They saw the election of two Bushes, a Clinton and the first black president of the United States. And some of you will get this, this uh, analogy I'm making. They're more familiar with the Star Wars prequel than the original trilogy. <laughs> 
In the business world, millennials are 36% of America's current workforce, and they will make up nearly half of the US workers in the next five years, half. Contrast that with the generation that I am, Generation X, we represent only 16% of the workforce. So we're talking about sweeping huge changes. As Fortune recently mentioned, millennials view the workplace through the same lens of new technology, instant, open, limitless. In fact, professors of the University of Texas at Austin, they found that 66% of millennials are interested in starting their own business. So we're back to this entrepreneurial story. They've turned generation, into, generation Y into the generation, why not start a business in my parents' garage? That's how they really see life. So what does this mean for business, big and small? It means it's going to be harder to attract and retain millennial talent. If, they're, if they aren't putting out their own shingle, they have very high expectations of their employers. And I'm sure many of you have millennials working with you know what I'm talking about. In 2014, Deloitte did an interview and a survey, and they discovered that millennials want to work for businesses that, one, foster innovative thinking, two, provide skill development, and three, make a contr positive contribution to society. So this means that once companies have attracted this young talent, they have to work extraordinarily hard to keep it, probably more so than any other time in American business. So establishing a culture of innovation is going to be key. They talk about innovation over and over and over again. They want organizations that encourage input, are open to new suggestions, and reward creative ideas. Gone are going to be the days for this cohort of workers where you work in a silo, alone, or in a department, and you are very much separate from the bigger enterprise. So as a result of that, this will lead to organizations and businesses with vastly different connections between departments, between people, between ideas. The kind of connections that will be essential to the relationship building that millennials crave and that they've grown up on, even if that relationship building was all virtual. We've all heard the millennials are the mentor me generation. Again, I'm sure some of you have experienced that. So Forbes has said it's essential for millennials to feel empowered, to be allowed to take risks, make mistakes, understand the grand vision, and not feel like a tiny part of a large organization. That's very, very hard to pull off, I have to say, especially the last part in big companies where you have thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. These aspects of career development are especially important for women and minorities in this generation. Despite business advances in diversity and inclusion, we all know this, we know women and minorities still face a lot of roadblocks to equal pay, top jobs, and access to capital, and the millennials are more diverse than any other generation. So nearly 42% of millennials identify with a race or ethnicity other than white. 42% of the 75 million people that I talked about. That's twice the number of the baby boom generation when they were the same age. And in educational att attainment, millennial women actually outpace men. We've heard this over and over again. More women in college, more women in certain uh, fields than ever before. Needless to say, it would be a huge misstep for companies not to recognize this subset of the millennial population and what they bring to the table. So the cultivating the next generation of millennial leaders is not only, as we all know, the right thing to do, it's obviously in the best interest of all of our organization, organizations. So there is a strong case for harvesting this millennial talent because they are the pipeline. From an economic standpoint, our best chance to achieve robust, sustainable growth is to adapt to this incoming wave of bright-eyed, curious new thinkers. I do believe their insights and creativity have the potential to take many of our organizations should they choose to work in small or large organizations and not be entrepreneurs themselves, take many of these organizations to new heights. They'll also assure global competitiveness by driving new technologies and expanding networks. I mean, this is to the generation that was shaped by events like 9-11 and the Great Recession. I mean, they've had a lot coming at, at them, including obviously the extraordinarily rapid advances in technology. So because of that, they have a different view of the world, perhaps more different than any other time, thanks to social media, and perhaps even a better connection to that world. Again, virtual, but still no less a connection to that world. 
So the point is this, as lofty as their goals may be, and I can tell you, sometimes they are pretty lofty, we have to figure out how to embrace this millennial gen generation and their aspirations, not only as entrepreneurs, but again, as, as teammates inside of bigger organizations or small organizations. We have to reckon with the fact that they're here and they, their ambitions are rooted not only in their own self-interest, but also in the interest of, of improving and connecting our society at large. I mean, they've made that very clear. The, the greater good is on their mind. They're equipped with skills to bring some of the most com comprehensive advancements, advancements to the business world we've ever seen. So I think it's going to be a very, very exciting time for entrepreneurship and talent development specifically because of these millennials. Thank you very much for your time. Please welcome former U.S. Representative and political analyst for MSNBC and CNBC, Harold Ford Jr. So, Melody, you talked about big organizations and millennials. You have such a great perspective on all of this as an investor, as a chair of one of uh, the most creative companies, uh, a company that creates and innovates uh, on the West Coast. You sit on the board of a big company on the, on the East Coast, and you sit on a great retail company on the West Coast as well. How do you guys integrate talent and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ideas in those companies and what as a board member how do you oversee that how do you encourage that how do you direct that and how do you assess that well it's a, i actually think that's a great question because integrating entrepreneurs in some of the giant companies that i'm a part of is something that is front and center so if you look at estee lauder for an example where i've been on the board for more than a decade we buy a lot of businesses and you are trying to think about whatever that business might be, how to bring that culture into the organization without changing it. So whatever the magic is that is there, it is still there. But at the same time, the greater organization benefits from it. And Essie Lauder has just such a remarkable history of acquisitions. Bumble and Bumble, Aveda, La Mer. I mean, I could go on and on and on of all the, the brands that they've bought over the years, including a lot of acquisitions recently. So how to create an environment for that entrepreneur who bled for that business and is now selling it to thrive is something that is front and center, especially because if you're an acquirer, you wanna make sure that there's no bad view of you as you're looking to continue to acquire, should that be the case. Right. So that is something, you know, people hear about. Warren Buffett has been one who's been famous for that, that he brings in the entrepreneurs and leaves them alone, and they're inside of the Berkshire Hathaway business, but they more or less continue to run the businesses as they run them, as they have run them before. So I think that's a very, very big deal. When it comes to innovation, when you think of a company like DreamWorks, innovation, and even Starbucks, I mean, there's innovating in coffee all the time, believe right. it or not. Um, Innovation and how to tap into that innovation, particularly with, with younger people and um, people who are bringing fresh new ideas, to create an environment where innovation can thrive in a large organization is something that does present a major, major challenge because one of the things that we all know all too well, cultures get entrenched and there's a, quote, way of doing things. I mean, we have a saying at Ariel, if you're a new employee and someone says, this is how we've always done things, they should be fired. <laughs> they really should, because that is, that is a mentality of entrenchment as opposed to a mentality of innovation and new ideas. So I think all of us, if it's a company that's big, a company that's small, um, the idea of dealing with this innovation and entrepreneurs, it's a new day. You know, that, that the innovation is every day and the entrepreneurial story hopefully is what is the lifeblood and in, in the DNA of no matter what size the company is. Your perspective on these boards also gives you, I think, a great insight into the economy. We, we hear that growth is happening. It may be uneven growth around, the, around different markets around the country. How do you assess it as an investor at Ariel, and how do you see it from your perspective and these purchases on these boards? We feel very, very good about America. U.S. businesses are in the very best shape that they've been in in decades. Their balance sheets are extraordinarily clean. Their, very, their productivity levels are very, very high. They got leaner and meaner after the financial crisis. There's just no two ways about it. So even if we do expe ex experience some kind of, um, of short-term 
negative period of negative growth in the country, you know, even if we were to have a recession, even if we were to have some bumps in the stock market, we think that this U.S. economy is so well positioned, we can just walk it off. We really do. Um, is there a sector you're more excited about than other sectors? Well, we're bottom-up investors, so we're just looking company by company, day by day. There's not any one area that, that we are more excited about than ever. We've had areas that have done extraordinarily well. Coming out of the financial crisis, we bought some financial companies, not generic banks, but specialized financial companies that have just been you know, fantastic and exceeded all expectations. And we think those companies will continue to do well. We own companies like KKR and Blackstone, which will continue to benefit from moves into alternative investments and private equity and things like that. We bought companies like Jones Lang LaSalle and CB Richard Ellis, which now goes as CBRE and Jones Lang LaSalle, now goes as JAL, JLL, but both were um, real estate uh, management companies that basically helped big global businesses manage real estate portfolios around the world as well as help with transactions and the like. Those were just wonderful, wonderful opportunities at the time because if you were real estate related in any way, you just got thrown away during the financial crisis. So there, there are a number of things in the portfolio that you know, I would have to say we are, are very, very excited about, but overall it's not any one area. We're looking at uh, because we invest in the U.S. and the traditional portfolios we have. In the U.S., we see a lot of opportunity. We also have global and international portfolios. And I have to say, because the, the rest of the world is going to benefit from a stronger dollar. You know, we've had the wind at our backs as the U.S. as the dollar um, uh, was not as strong against the euro. The, the world is moving the other way, and that's definitely going to benefit uh, some of the big global uh, foreign companies. Is there a concern as an investor about interest rates being raised and the timing of that and the, it's inevitable. the pace of that? You know, we're not market timers in any way. It is going to happen. These are the lowest rates, I mean, ever in some ways. Uh, and the, the Federal Reserve has signaled very clearly that they will raise rates as a question of then, when. What we, you know, basically take advantage of is this market gets uh, spooked every couple of weeks about, oh, it's going to be June, it's going to be September, and we say, the timing doesn't matter. It is inevitable. And so the question is, what is the long-term play and what's the long-term story? Um, and honestly, when the market has these down days because they're worried about the Fed, like two days ago, that just creates a buying opportunity for us if we're looking long-term. We're going to own our average business for three years minimum, but you know, we're looking at five years and beyond, and we have companies in our portfolio we've owned for two decades. So a quarter change in interest rates does, should not be materially affecting our view of that company over the long term. As you talked about millennials in your speech, you think about U.S. millennials, global, uh, those non-U.S. millennials in different ways. Are they yeah. inspired by the same things? Obviously, opportunity here in America is greater than is in, in big, big pockets and big corners of the world. But how are millennials around the globe responding to some of the trends and things you talked about. That's a really excellent question because I wonder if they are called millennials around the globe, and this is why I say this. In certain countries, mm -hmm. young people have dominated in terms of population for m many, many years. So if you look at certain Middle Eastern countries where, or certain African countries where more than half of the population is under a certain age, in some ways, they, we are coming into what, else, what the rest of the world has been facing. So that's why I say I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's an excellent question. Are they called millennials in the rest of the world? Um, and I think the issues are very different because if you look at um, Western Europe, for example, or if you look at, um, let's, just, let's just focus on Western Europe, the population that is under the age of 25 is the unemployment rate is staggering for those individuals. I mean, ge genuinely, you know, you're talking numbers that are north of 50 percent in places like Spain and in some other places. So, because of that, I actually think the idea of the traditional job and traditional clear career may be completely rethought, and this entre entrepreneurship opportunity may be the only way for some of those individuals to achieve their dreams. So I do think that is a really excellent question that I haven't thought a lot about, but I'll certainly give it some thought. This conference focuses so much, rightly so, on, on Michigan and Detroit, 
the renaissance that's taken place in Detroit, and it's still underway, led by many in this room and my, my great old pal, Dennis Archer, who is the main reason I participate here over the years, and I thank him again for making sure I get invited. But the mayor and the governor spoke, and the mayor spoke powerfully yesterday about education. Are there things that Ariel thinks about in terms of Detroit? Are there investments that you have in and around anything happening here? And how do you see this story uh, with the backdrop being the nation uh, Detroit playing out over the next several years? Well, first I have to acknowledge uh, Mayor Archer as well because I'm here because of him. When he calls, you don't say no. This is true. <laughs> he made it clear. He asked me a couple of times and the date didn't work out. So um, I'm absolutely uh, very complimented by the invitation that came from him directly to me. Um, what I would say when we think about investing, we've had a number of great investments in the state of Michigan. So we've made a lot of money over the years. We don't own this company right now, but we owned Herman Miller for a long time under Max Dupree when he was running it. And then afterwards, we all read his book, Leadership is an Art. Um, and so uh, Herman Miller is one company that I can say, you know, made a lot of money for our shareholders over the years. We also owned uh, Steelcase. We own a number of other companies over the years in the Michigan area. What I would say is now that we think about Detroit specifically to that question, as painful, and I, I know, I spent some time going in and out of Detroit for speeches and to see clients, et cetera. As painful as this experience has been from Detroit, which is you know, unimaginable in some ways, and the effect that it's had on, on the city and the population, et cetera, I am looking at it as the glass half full, which is that the bankruptcy absolutely gives them the fresh start to be the great um, city that they've always been in terms of the, America's, the story of America. And I do think that some of the unique opportunities that are coming to Detroit now, you know, from technology-related businesses and financial businesses and the like, is something that will, will be extraordinarily powerful in years to come in ways that we don't understand. Not to mention the anchors of the auto industry that, that, are, that are thriving in Detroit today. I think this is one of the areas that I've, that I think is really, the story just isn't really being told about the recovery of the U.S. auto industry and what happened and the bold moves that were made at the time of the rescue, uh, you know, in terms of where we were and where we are now and the comeback of the American car. I mean, I think there's, that if anything tells us what Detroit is made of and what is possible. Because I think at the time, if you re re go back and reread those headlines and the choices that Washington had at that moment when they made those investments, at the time, there was ridicule. And it was absolutely the right thing to do when you looked at the amount of jobs that were at stake and the, the, that storied American history. And the, the remarkable thing is all those naysayers, I'm not sure how much they're really acknowledging about how it worked out. Switch to politics for, for one moment in a political discussion the, 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 from a substantive standpoint to talk about income inequality, uh, the uneven distribution of opportunity in the country. I know you personally and know you well, know you and John both and know how committed uh, you are not only to your business but to philanthropy and to, to trying to figure out constructive ways to grapple with these issues. The national conversation around how we deal with creating more jobs and higher paying jobs in the political realm, you see it from the corporate realm, but are involved also on in the political side of it. Give me your, 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 your kind of reactions to how Washington, how Springfield, how state capitals around the country are trying to address these issues that manifest itself with raises in the minimum wage and other things. Are these the most effective ways to go about addressing this, or are there other ways more constructive and, frankly, productive ways to deal with these issues? So I would say right off unequivocally, I am in favor of higher minimum wage. However, I think the story is getting lost. Minimum wage is deflecting the real issue, which is a living wage. And we need to be a society that aspires to a living wage for all of our citizens. That deserves an applause. On that. <laughs> I had the, uh, the, the opportunity to see a map of the major cities in America by what the current minimum wage is and what the living wage should be. And the interesting thing about that map, when you look at it, it makes it very clear that even some of the bold statements that have been made about $10.25 as a national minimum wage, 
are too low in certain places. So if you live in San Francisco, you are still working poor at $10.25, and you cannot make ends meet, and you probably have a number of jobs, as well as New York City and other places. Now, conversely, and this is not to say that I'm for anything that is, is minimal, in other cities, smaller towns, more rural areas, that 1025 is, a, is, is much- More impactful. Yes, than, um, than it would have been otherwise. So the bottom line for me is I am very encouraged by the conversation. I'm really happy to see companies like Walmart and McDonald's and others talk about this and make it very, very clear where they're going. I think it's right for society. I think that wage inflation has been the one missing piece in this recovery in terms of helping everyday Americans, which is so important to the overall economic growth of the United States, particularly <coughs> as it relates to the middle class. And I think that we can't be too bold in our thinking on that. I reject this idea, and I know there are economists who disagree with me, so I, you know, I respectfully disagree, that uh, you know, this will cost us jobs and therefore we shouldn't do it, because if you have a whole bunch of people working who can barely make it, this just does not make sense to me. And you read these stories and you know, it's heartbreaking. And unfortunately, all of us know someone. You know, I, I, I joke that when you're African American person, no matter how successful you are, there's someone in your family who's one step away from eviction. And that keeps us very honest and aware of what's going on in the world and I think that's a very good thing. The conversation nationally in the political realm is about tax, changing tax policy, perhaps lifting regulations on businesses. I heard you recently on, on CBS talk a little bit about uh, the FCC's decision to, uh, to or not, not the FCC, but the Justice Department's decision not to allow Comcast and to buy Time Warner. And uh, uh, you've heard conversations around energy and too much regulation on the energy industry. Are there things that government can be doing along those lines? Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that as ways? as a way to, uh, to increase productivity, to increase job creation, to put upward pressure on wages? So I'm of the belief that there's always a better way, no matter how good the way is. And I think that the one thing that has happened with regulation is that because we had a near-death experience in terms of the, the, the magnitude of the Great Recession and how we came so close to really something that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, um, if worse, I think because of that, the way I've described it is that I think that many, and it's not you know, just regulators, just many, I can, I can show it to you as it relates to individual investors or institutional investors as well as some of our regula regula regulators, I feel like we're, so, we're still suffering from a form of post-traumatic post stress disorder, that we are still very skittish and nervous, and we feel at any moment the wheels could come off, and so as a result of that, in some ways, we're over, we've overcorrected. And, and I get that. As I say, I, that, that is not something that I say with any form of disparagement. I do understand. It's like if you, you know, we've all been in a situation where you're in a car and you think you're about to have a car accident, you check your seatbelt again, you know, you, you drive slower, you know, all of those things. We've all had those moments. So I don't say this in any way being uh, disrespectful, but I do think sometimes the pendulum swings too far one way. And I think we need to make sure that whatever rules and regulations we have make sense. And I think the problem that I've seen, at least with some of the regulatory issues that affected businesses like Ariel as a mutual fund company, et cetera, is that whatever happened before probably won't be the thing that takes us down the next time. <laughs> so right. it's great we've got all these belt and suspenders for now the, you know, the, right. the likelihood of the nth degree of that. Right. <laughs> you've got to think of something else because it'll be something that you know, we just didn't think of. And make sure that the people who are writing these regula regulations and, and dealing with this le legislation are coming at it from the perspective of understanding what they're doing. So, and, and then the reason I say that is I think that you have career people who have done this and who've not necessarily been in the trenches and maybe don't always have the opportunity to see all sides of the issue. But I, I say that with a tremendous amount of respect for what they have to do. I mean, I can't imagine how the SEC can get everything they get done on a day-to-day -day basis when you think of all the people, institutions, et cetera, that they have to regulate. So you work in this space, and not to put you on the spot, but I, but I will because I love you and I know you. What 
if you think about Dodd-Frank and you think about the financial regulatory hangover, what is the one thing that has worked well? Is it increased capital that these firms have to have or and one, the one thing that has worked the least or should say be changed to help unleash more growth and more opportunity and more investment opportunities? So what has worked well? This is going to sound like I'm dodging the question and I'm not. I think what has worked well is the overall conversation that average people have a sense of banking in America and what some of the issues are and that those people have an opinion. I think that's actually a really good thing, that it's not this, um, no longer this uh, absolutely big and unclear set of entities. So the mere fact that it was on the front page of the paper every single day and that story just got played out over and over and over and over and over again is something that I think has made people more aware. And I think it's put leaders on notice. So Across the board. Across the board. Across the board. Um, what hasn't worked well is I think that there have been some things that have been overregulated, or there have been multiple regulators coming at institutions. So the big banks have talked about this, that they deal with so many regulators now that that probably could be rationalized around a couple of entities, not you know, as many entities as they deal with. So that, to me, doesn't make sense, because that leads to, that is anti-entrepreneur, in that I think about industries now where who would start a bank? today. Right. No, I mean that really. Right. Like, right. like, who would look at that and say, yep, that's what I want to do with my life? I've even seen it with the mutual fund industry. The, the rules, regulations, et cetera, are so hard. I think it's very hard for just a small guy to pull off the John Rogers story that I talked about at the beginning of my conversation because the hurdles are so high, the amount of money that you need to do it, the scale that you need, et cetera, and the big guys are so big that you know, it's, it's a challenge. I sit here and say Ariel has nearly 11 billion under management. Well, the largest competitor, competitor has three trillion. You know, we're like, you know, a snowflake in the universe. Um, not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> we all wish we could be that snowflake in the. Uh... <laughs> well, I was thinking about the whiteness of the snowflake. <laughs> so let's, let, let, let's switch. <laughs> Let's switch gears as we run, as we are closing it on time. You are, you and John are, are great humanitarians and philanthropists. You and your husband are great philanthropists. Where do you see, um, uh, the, the, as you think about nonprofit money and nonprofit ideas, obviously there's great focus on education and great focus on healthcare and the environment, but where is your focus right now and John's focus and even outside your, 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 your foundation work at home and your foundation work even with the companies. I know at Starbucks you guys had a, a, big, uh, situ a, a big push over the last several months around race and encouraging that conversation. Uh, and I want to end on race in your TED talk in a minute, but just where are you on philanthropy right now? So my work has personally been um, dedicated to financial literacy. Right. So here's the thing for me. In high school in America today, you could take wood shop or auto and not a class on investing which leads me to always ask audiences one question. Who whittles in their spare time? <laughs> Who is cleaning their own carburetor, right? But you can't take a class on investing in most high schools, which has a tremendous effect not only on you, whatever wealth you may or may not be able to leave behind, and a feeling of financial security, which has a tremendous effect on your health, your happiness, a whole bunch of things. So for me, this idea of, of making sure we have a financially literate society is super important. And I say this again, maybe a little bit tongue in cheek, but imagine if our society were financially literate. Imagine if Congress were financially literate. Imagine. <laughs> no, and the reason I say that, and I, I notwithstanding the members of Congress who no, are in the room, we see certainly didn't mean the level. Of <laughs> no, but I mean this without being disrespectful. We wouldn't be play, paying a debt ceiling game like we are playing that has such tremendous implications for our society and the view of America around the world. America got downgraded, downgraded because of our politics, not because of our ability to pay our bills. And that is something that 
we wouldn't have gotten there if people had really known the implications of some of the things they were tying together with that debt ceiling conversation. That's not being partisan, it's just factual. Um, so that is something that I actually feel very strongly about. So we need to make sure the next generation of, of, of young people, particularly minorities, are very experienced around this issue of money and investing. Unlike John Rogers, most of us who are of people of color did not grow up in a home where we were getting stocks when we were 12 years old. Right. Most of us weren't reading annual reports in our spare time, and most of us didn't know the difference between the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P, and maybe still don't. And yet that, as we have changed from a society of, in many cases, traditional pensions, where you work for a company for 30 years and we retired with a gold watch, We've turned to a society where you're making the decision and you're in control and the average American will have 11 jobs in their lifetime and that 401k money will go with them or not if they cash it out. The implications are so huge if we don't get this right. So this financial literacy issue to me is probably one of the biggest things that we could solve for in our society and one that I think is worth solving. In terms of uh, aerial, Financial literacy with our Ariel School has been just that. So we have a saying at Ariel, we've admired. You have admired, a school in Chicago, right? I right. just want to make sure you say that out loud. We have a saying that we've admired the problem long enough. We've admired this problem. <laughs> so what are we going to do about it? So we started a school called the Ariel Community Academy. We have a saving investment curriculum. We have 550 kids, and every first grade class is given 20,000 real dollars to invest, and the money follows them through their grade school career, with them taking increasing responsibilities for managing. I just met with your governor and and Governor was, Snyder. Yes, of course, and was talking to him about this issue and how we've been documenting this curriculum so that we can give it to any school in America because we think it's that important. But that was a long slog. We've been at it for almost 20 years and you know, getting a financial literacy curriculum written from beginning to end for K through first grade through 8, you know, took us many, many years. ING was a big supporter of that effort and helped underwrite it. And then on the family side, our work has been really focused on education. Um, my husband feels very strongly about film schools <laughs> and has done a lot around that. And I feel very strongly about equal opportunity. And so we've been doing a lot of things to make sure that everyone has a chance and that we are targeting uh, diverse organizations, diverse schools, minorities in schools, et cetera, to make sure that the playing field is, is more level because of us. We've obviously had a tremendous amount of fortune, and I've always said to people that we are just stewards of society's money. That's what it is. We're holding it for society and trying to make sure that we do, do a good job. It's not about us having a better life because we have a great life. And so as a result of that, we take this idea very seriously of how we're gonna leave behind this mark, including the museum that we're building in Chicago, which will be in many ways a major center of education in the Midwest. Last but not least, Starbucks, when you talk about them, I mean, I was emailing Howard this morning and we were going back and forth. He sent me this article um, that I gave to Doris uh, Kearns Goodwin before she left because she said she was writing a book on leadership. Um, he sent me this article called Leadership in Solitude that like rocked me, like really just shaped me. I've been sitting with it for the last few months and was just brilliantly written and said a lot about what makes for great leadership and how we need time with our thoughts and to form ideas and how society and technology and all these things is actually not making us better leaders. In some ways, it's moving us away from that. So I emailed Howard this morning and I said, you have no idea how much this article has affected me. You know, I'm just, I'm thinking about it every day. And he sent an email back and he said, you know, I have no idea how much you've affected me. And we were going back and forth and when I talk, when you talk about brave and courageous leaders. Howard Schultz is at the top of the list for me right now in terms of corporate leadership in our country and willing to go where no man has ever gone um, in terms of some of these conversations that we've, he's been willing to have and be willing to take the slings and arrows that come along with it. And that race conversation was hard, hard. And the reaction was in some ways not surprising and in other ways just very sad. Speed round before we close out. One, outside of the CEOs that you work with and or boards and your, your, your partner, John, who's the most impressive CEO in America today? Outside of the outside ones, of the ones you work with? with? Wow. Boy, you're really putting me on the spot there. Well, not just or because he three. puts food on the table. Um, I think Bob Iger at Disney is pretty remarkable. 
I've had the opportunity to spend some time with him lately. What he's done there is remarkable and created a culture and a, a, that existed, but taking it to a whole nother level. I think Les Moonves at CBS is a great, great leader and another one who's just you know, done something great. CBS kind of leads in all areas when you look at television. Um, there are so many that I could point out that it's, I, I mean, we think Warren Buffett is God at Ariel. <laughs> I mean, we do, he's the greatest investor of all time. And so as we always say to each other, you know, instead of wondering, we have a manual from the greatest investor, why don't more people follow the manual? So, I mean, there's so many, it's just. Staying on the leadership, who's the next president of the United States? <laughs> Finally, who's your favorite Star Wars character? <laughs> uh, my favorite Star Wars character. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Melody Hobson, thank you. <laughs>